The next um, uh, entrepreneur is a real pleasure to introduce Ms. Eleni Kitcher. She is somebody that I, I, I got to know uh, again recently within the past year. She's based out in Dubai. She's a Greek uh, citizen uh, originally. She's um, been a senior executive at, at uh, uh, she'll tell you, but uh, very large internet companies. So she has probably a good perspective on some of the things that were, were spoken about by Theodorus just a moment ago. Um, she's top of her field. She has a, a very interesting perspective on leadership, which I felt was quite important for her to share. Would you please welcome Ms. Eleni Kitra to the stage. Eleni. Wow, that was quite an introduction. Um, I don't know if I'll be up to that, but um, nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Great to be in Greece. Always. So a couple of things about me before I move on into sharing with you what I have to share today. Um, I spent most of my life working, my 30 plus years, in uh, big corporations, you know, technology driven or technology enabled companies, uh, Asian, South African, American. But always in these companies, what I was doing was mostly building up things from scratch. So I had a very entrepreneurial spirit from the beginning, but I was actually operating from a safe environment. So I'll give you another, um, an example. I was working with Sony, and I launched PlayStation, OK? The first video game console, it was nothing to Sony, but then it became like a massive thing. It changed completely the way that entertainment, definition of target audiences, revenue streaming, uh, digitalization of gaming changed. My last 10 years in Dubai, I was in Facebook, but I was in the beginning of commercializing the platform. So I was one of the first people to make Facebook available to advertisers, and then we went to move on into how this uh, resonates with advertisers, with users, products, and I saw technology from inside out as something to offer to people. After 30 plus years, I decided to move out completely, uh, launch my company, and then going into what it is about people and leadership. And the reason is that everything that comes out of the company, you know, the infrastructure, the operations, the money, the idea, if you don't have the right people, you're dead. Everything else is BS, okay? And we always forget about that. We forget about the human capital, because some say, okay, we're gonna find them. But finally, what it comes down is that we go always in the safety zone we have because we don't want to make changes and because we don't think they have a direct impact on the bottom line. And just to say that this gave me purpose because I could combine my love for people, my tech understanding, and also my love for entrepreneurs because I do believe that innovation can come only from people who can actually take a risk not from the ones who stay behind and they just stay on the money. And with that, I'm just giving you this bullet train approach, which is about my, I don't know about you, but my life every morning I wake up, I think that I have done nothing. I'm not competitive enough, I'm not good enough, I haven't managed to make a lot of money, my kids do not love me enough. Nothing is enough <laughs> and everything changes. Okay, I have two kids, 20 and 22, out of home, they're studying abroad. I miss them massively. I'm a classical Greek mother where I cook for them, I love them, but I want them to be out of my home because I want them to have their independence. But my life, I feel it's very uh, fast. I don't have the time to think. I don't have the time to allocate the significant effort I can in order to make things change. And in that is how companies, organizations, governments, individuals, live and breathe because they don't have the time to think what they need to change. And this is where the common denominator of people is not included. And this is where leadership is completely different than what we would like to have. We talk about people and if we had to think about the world or the little community we are, our little Greece, Greece is 11 million people, okay? It's a very small country compared to other countries, is non-existent. But because we're discussing with some people here, geographically we make sense and we have started changing again, we get a lot of attention and we have a lot to share. But think that in an ideal world, every person had the opportunity to do something in their lives and can contribute to the society. No discrimination, no bias, no hate, no fear, nothing. That's the world we would like to live. And 
The thing is that in this way to think of an ideal world, we don't actually take the activity, we don't take the action to make things change. And a very simple example is that when we see the, the extremes, you know, the, um, the, the limits of population, the very young people, that's why I asked before about the Gen Z, which is 25% of the population, and some countries have massive number of people, or the ones who are above 50, 55, which they are considered to be dead. Women which are above 55 and they are menopause, they are dead, they don't have to be there, and then you see there is a whole effort to push them forward and talk about anti-aging. So the discrimination kicks in without even considering or thinking about that and makes people take wrong decisions. However, since we're in Greece, I had to take, get Aristoteles because I love him. Um, because he was the guy, he's dead, you know that, huh? It's uh, 23, 24 years, 23, 24, 100 years ago, that he was talking about leadership, inclusive leadership, Evdemonia, I will tell it in Greek because I cannot pronounce it properly in English, which is about how to make you happy and have a purpose, and the golden mean. He was talking that you need to be in an environment with everything that is around you can make you be your best self because that's the only way you can contribute, and that's what we call inclusive leadership. The power of inclusive leadership is massive. If you go and talk to someone and say, inclusive leadership means you completely disregard biases. You don't have anything that has to be, you have to fear because someone is a different um, uh, nationality, doesn't speak well English, doesn't have all the capabilities you want, or is from the wrong gender. And at the moment we talk about gender, male, female, but we know there's a lot in between and we have this kind of gender fluidity. I'm not going to talk about LGBTQ plus or whatever, but I want you to see that there are so many aspects that biases kicks in. You know there's a hair bias. If my hair is not nice, you're not going to like me. If I wear jeans, you're not going to like me. I have to wear this outfit. So in order for you, me, to be likable, I have to follow specific ways, okay? That's when bias kicks in. When I was working for Facebook, we found out that we couldn't attract people of specific talents, and you know what was one of the problems? Because all the panels that were coming together to make the, the final um, interviews were males, that was one thing. And the second thing, they were all speaking English perfectly. <coughs> So think of people who are very smart, but they come from countries where either the, their accent or the way they learned English do not have this kind of perfect accent. They had an issue in how they were being actually delivering um, the, 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 the proposal, the, the innovation, and everything. And the thing is that, that when we talk about inclusive leadership, we know there are measures, we know there are KPIs, there are metrics, who they find, they define how important is on the bottom line of a company when you have inclusive leadership. But the inclusive leadership cannot work with the collaboration between the organizations, okay, the private sector, and the government. They need to be interconnected. And that means that there needs to be legislation, there needs to be specific values that are being shared, there needs to be a way that when they talk to each other, they actually follow the same pattern. You need to walk the talk, and this is not only to say I'm gonna give a quota for X percent of women or X percent of black people in a company, you need to be able to show that and make the the, the, the regulation, you need to make the operations, you need to make the infrastructure to be able to attract them. The way that government and companies work together, because we must not forget, companies in the private sector is part of the, of the economy, is part of, the, um, of a country. You cannot have two different completely approaches. They need to be having some things in common. First of all, they need to have shared values and culture. If they don't have it, then they speak a different language. I'll give an example from where I live at the moment. So I moved to Dubai something like 11 years ago. What was Dubai 11 years ago? It's not anymore. 
And it's not because they have a lot of money and they make things the tallest, the most beautiful, the whatever, you, whatever you imagine exists there. It's because the moment the government decided to make changes in adopting specific um, guidelines and make the companies follow them, the whole thing changed. The whole thing, the whole narrative changed, which makes finally whoever goes to Dubai or Middle East, but I will stick with Dubai, they know what they are going for. They know what they're going to get out of that. To give you a simple example, you can set up your own company in two days and you have your uh, business bank account in one day online. You don't even have to go to any kind of service. Role modeling and inspiration. For me, they're all modeling. I would, go, I would like to say real life models. And that means whoever is in the leadership of a company or in the leadership of a country, they need to be able to be the ambassadors of what we talk. There are so many companies globally who they have all these kind of DNI strategies, but when they go out, it's completely BS. Complete BS. And we've seen that people have been accused of a number of not nice incidents because when they were in, the, in their company, they were trying to promote diversity and equality and inclusivity, but when they go out and they go into their own uh, place, which is safe for them, they don't manage to do anything. Economic impact and talent attraction and retention. We talked before about uh, brain drain. It's still happening a lot. We see countries being able to attract people very, very well. Why? Because they give the benefits for that. In Middle East, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Saudi Arabia, they're fighting each other to give golden visas because they don't give easily passports uh, to attract younger audiences, investments, and people to establish their business in the region. Why? Because they know they cannot rely on the Emirates, although there is a high Emiratization uh, drive at the moment in the region, but they know they still need the new brains coming in. And that's why from the 10 million, we're going to go into the 20 million population. And at the moment, you have 167 nationalities. And the big wave coming in is the Chinese. Already, there is an infrastructure that can actually help and entertain the Chinese that coming in from real estate to entertainment to food to anything you can think about because they know that's the way to get these people, get their money, and then set up their own business. Social impact and equality and then reputation and global collaboration. In order to attract investments, money, companies, expansion, get into new markets, you need to be able to have the companies, the organizations, and the government, the countries work together, and then it will be able to report the progress or the chance in order to make decisions for that. The economic benefits of inclusive leadership, they are massive, and if I had to say a few of them, because we're discussing with Cos a little bit before that, companies with inclusive leadership, and I will start from the gender, companies with women in the decision-making roles, in the board of directors, but even in areas where usually they were male dominated, they're higher profitability because they have higher uh, innovation. Um, there are many, let me go into that, and I will stick to entrepreneurship. When you are able to absorb and get the infrastructure for more people, and I would say at the moment for more women, to be entrepreneurs, the way they contribute to the overall GDP is huge. They say that the gender gap, if it was bridged by 2025, it will add $28 trillion to the global GDP. In Middle East, only in three countries, UAE, Saudi, Egypt, the annual loss of revenue generation because of cultural and political limitations is $600 billion dollars because women cannot work. 600 billion dollars. This is huge. And on the other side, you have in the UAE, 87% growth in female entrepreneurship in an area where we know that female entrepreneurs, they have a massive issue 
they have the idea about whether they're ready to go and pitch, whether they're going to ready to get money, to ask for money, they just don't get considered. That's one of the reasons I'm working with one of the accelerators in Dubai to prepare female entrepreneurs to be able not only to get prepared for that, but to flourish and finally get what they do into life. We talked about technology. I am positive about technology, not because I was working for technology-driven companies, but I've seen the impact in my life and the, how much this was bettered. I will say, let's embrace the technology, do not fear the technology, but regulate the technology. Because we see that when you really, I wouldn't say comply, but when you really respect what technology can do and you know you understand technology and you know how to go deeper and make the things that change, you can actually be able to have better organization and better performance. Two years ago, um, when I was still with Facebook, I was pitching to clients about metaverse. You know what the... You know metaverse, okay? The wearables, all this kind of stuff, the seamless integration between the physical world and the virtual world. The biggest problem was not the technology, it was not understood. I had one client sleeping as I was speaking. And then when I told him if I, you know, if I bore him, he said, I don't understand. I cannot connect. I don't understand how it's going to have an impact in my business. So for me, technology needs to be understood, needs to be simplified in order to understand how to have it um, apply on the business. And the other thing is that when we talk about in digital inclusiveness, if we don't go higher into that, and we know that Greece is still toward the end, it's here. We will not be able to grow as an economy, as a uh, country, and then be more attractive to investment and to uh, new talents to come to Greece. So how could we reimagine inclusive leadership, and how could we reimagine, if I had to say, give me a Lenny, three, four action items I can do. And your seat, being the government of a country, or being the leadership of a company, doesn't mean you're there for life. You need to be able to think, what are the people you have and you're dealing with, what you're offering. Aristotle said, in order to be a leader, you need to be a follower as, we, as well. You need to be able to follow and understand what the people you're working with, they need from you. The second one is widen the impact. We only think like that when we need to think like that. We need to think about what kind of talents are we missing? What is that we don't have here? What's the ingredient that can make us successful without thinking that, no, 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 I don't like that. I don't like short people. I don't like loud people. When I first went to, um, to Dubai, they were calling me the loud Greek. I'm loud, but I'm because I'm alive. So you cannot <laughs> tell me that because I speak loud, you don't want me. Break the mold. We all have stereotypes. And the older we are, the more stereotypes we have because we feel very comfortable in there. Break the stereotypes, understand that you need to have different people in your company or organization with different mindsets that they can actually give you what I call the tough love conversation. Don't try to get the same ones. In the past, companies used to say, oh, they don't fit here because they don't have the same culture. BS. You don't have to have the same culture in order to be participating somewhere because you can actually redefine the culture of a company or a country. Pressure test. How do reality check your work? It shouldn't be only the elections to see if what you do works. You need to be able constantly, and I'm not talking only about the government, I'm talking also about the people and the companies, you need to test that. And you know something? 70% of startups they don't go into fruition because they don't have the right people and they don't make the right questions. Because they think if you have the technology and the idea, you are far ahead, this is not working. If people do not work and live, believe with you, they will not go forward. And finally, oops, include and execute, which for me the main word here is collaboration. Collaboration between companies, 
companies and government competitors or companies you never thought of, but you're able to get the ideas, bounce the ideas, bounce the experiences, and make things work. And with that, the loud Greek will stop, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Bravo. Wow. That is brilliant. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that and, and uh, I, I, I see the reason for your success in so many ways. It's been lovely to, to get to know you. Um, so would you say, Eleni, that you or we, we, the collective we, are we winning the war or not on inclusively? Do you, do you point to more things and say, yes, the tide of history is moving in the right direction or oh no, it's not? I'm always a very positive person I say that. Uh, the moment there is movement, there is traction, I think we are getting there. Mm -hmm. uh, situations like the war, financial stability, they take us back. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that because of the younger generation, they question everything in life. Mm -hmm. We are obliged to do that and I can tell you that one of the reasons I moved out from what I was going to go into talk about people inclusivity was my kids. Mm -hmm. It was actually my son who pushed me and say, go and do that because we need to change the thing. So I, I would say a big yes, but it needs more effort. Wow, okay, very good. Questions, who has a question? We got Yanni, Yanni Kalafatsis, yeah? Maybe we start. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Good so, man, right. good man, all right. So um, I used to work for big tech as well, the other side, Google. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, perhaps I'm an outlier, but I'm used to that. I never thought about any of the diversity factors. I always tried to hire and work with the best. We had. Yeah. Blind software engineers, we had yeah. gay, we had people with bad hair, we had fat, we had uh, thin, we had all ethnicities, the whole thing. So what bothers me these days, and I've been telling that to a lot of people, is that we're trying to fix the problem, in my opinion, in the wrong way, uh, by putting quota in companies. For me, quotas is the wrong way to fix a very important problem. The reason we don't have, according to what I've read, enough uh, um, women, enough females in IT was not because people necessarily didn't hire them, it was because they weren't going to university, you couldn't find them. So why not invest more in opportunities for diverse uh, populations, let's say, to get into um, equal opportunity environments rather than invest all this money and define, excuse my friends, bullshit quotas that yeah. make you restrain, you know, I might find the best person that I could hire, can't hire them because, hey, it's not a woman. So how do you feel about that? Okay, that's a very good question. By the way, that's always a debate we do. So, first of all, the lack of awareness and the lack of understanding how much this diversity has an impact on the business outcome, forget the HR, it's a challenge. The, the, I don't believe in quotas, but I will support them because if you don't have a number, you can easily relate and your brain easily can function and say, oh, I need to achieve that and then see how to achieve, there are people who will never open up to discuss even the second phase, which is, okay, if I want to reach, let's say, 20% of women there, or 20% of Indians over there, I will not be think about the kind of actions I need to take in order to make this happen proactively. So I don't believe in quotas, but I will use them because they can help my narrative, my journey, to achieve what I need to do. But this quota shouldn't be only one way because we go into the other side where you make people feel, some of kind of people, groups of people feeling that they're out of the dance floor. And this is not good. So the how plays a huge role. You know, Eleni, I wanted to kind of pick up on what Eleni, my, my view was always that, um, and I think just in general, not even a female male issue, but um, you can't win if you don't create the rules of the game. You have to create yeah. the rules of the game in order to win by your own rules, so to speak. And so I've always encouraged, and in fact, most of my close girlfriends have become entrepreneurs because I would get tired of hearing them talk about their boss. My boss is so stupid, my boss is so this and so forth. They say, then, then do better, do it yourself. And then they did and they found just enormous overwork, stress, but happiness, true fulfillment, and so forth. So to what extent is all of this, again, going to be um, opened up by women becoming entrepreneurs to gain control of you know, the accordion of life, I need to do more of this, now I need to do more yeah. of this, and so forth, is the answer for women not to worry about breaking through somebody's glass ceiling, but just to create their own cathedral, to become the entrepreneur? 
So the, 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 my effort with women, especially for being more entrepreneurs, is that the definition of what success looks like, mm -hmm. it's not the one we used to do, mm -hmm. or the one we used to, to, th to, th to think about that. You need to define what makes sense for you. However, you should not go into the area where I'm an entrepreneur because I make cupcakes. Because mm -hmm. we've seen that so much, and that's completely the, the opposite thing of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You want to show, I think someone said before that failing is okay. Mm -hmm. That was another thing that we didn't think about. If I fail, oh my God, I'm a complete failure. No, there is a new process that you need to see yourself, that you can do things, you're not gonna make them happen, you continue, you, you sit, blah, blah, blah. That's the way we need to make women see, so change the mindset, but in a way which means that we are accepting them yeah. in this role. These were the stereotypes yeah. kicking sometimes and they take them off. Okay, one last question for Eleni before, one last question, yeah? Now that you have me. Yeah. The, you know, I, I, I just remember being uh, Helena Morrissey who created the, you know, 20% club, was it 30%? I can't remember. One of the, yeah, there you go. Um, but I, I just remember, so she spoke at one of our FTE um, events in the United Kingdom years ago and so forth. And for those of you who don't know Helena, she has nine children. She looks just as glamorous as, as Eleni. And she ran many, many uh, investment firms. And she had this incredible... Um, uh, and I mean this is enormous respect, but almost like a, a, a kind of Mary Poppins, she would say, you know, kind of, all aboard, men, let's go, let's go put those women on the boards, you know? And I just thought, wow, how can she be that way? But she made it almost, she drew them in. And she had this very British charm, but by God, was it charming? And she succeeded. She got a lot of men on her team, so to speak, to get women on the boards. And it was her own style in, in different cultures and so forth, but I really, felt that everybody figures it out themselves, right? She figured it out by finding a way to bring people into her mission by making them feel like it was just all gonna be just so much fun, let's go do it, right? And I, and I think, and you're clearly having fun doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I think that's, that's, that's the thing, is you have to be who you are, and that was yes. said really well by Theodora Sterling, you know, we are who we think we are. And so um, the more we project that narrative about who we are, the more we bring people into, into our game. I agree with you, Julie. I agree. Miss Eleni Kicha, could you please thank, you. thank her?